Would you please stand with me? <clears throat> and turn in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 54. For those following along in one of the Pew Bibles, that's page 614. I'll be reading verses 1 through 17 from the ESV Bible for this morning's reading. <clears throat> Sing, O barren one who did not bear. Break forth into singing and cry aloud, you who have not been in labor. For the children of the desolate one will be more than the children of her who is married, says the Lord. Enlarge the place of your tent. Let the curtains of your habitations be stretched out. Do not hold back. Lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes. For you, for you will spread abroad to the right and to the left, and your offspring will possess the nations and will people the desolate cities. Fear not, for you will not be ashamed. Be not confounded, for you will not be disgraced. For you will forget the shame of your youth and the reproach of your widowhood you will remember no more. For your Maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is His name. And the Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer. The God of the whole earth He is called. For the Lord has called you like a wife deserted and grieved in spirit, like a wife of youth when she is cast off, says your God. For a brief moment, I deserted you. But with great compassion, I will gather you. In overflowing anger, for a moment, I hid my face from you. But with everlasting love, I will have compassion on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. This is like the days of Noah to me, as I swore that in the waters of Noah should no more go over the earth. So I have sworn that I will not be angry with you and will not rebuke you. For the mountains may depart and the hills be removed, but my steadfast love shall not depart from you. And my covenant of peace shall not be removed, says the Lord who has compassion on you. O afflicted one, storm-tossed and not comforted, behold, I will set your stones in antimony and lay your foundations with sapphires. I will make your pinnacles of agate, your gates of carbuncles, and all your wall of precious stones. All your children shall be taught by the Lord, and great shall be the peace of your children. In righteousness you shall be established, you shall be far from oppression, for you shall not fear, and from terror it shall not come near you. If anyone stirs up strife, it is not from me. Whoever stirs up strife with you shall fall because of you. Behold, I have created the smith who blows the fire of coals and produces a weapon for its purpose. I have also created the ravager to destroy. No weapon that is fashioned against you shall succeed, and you shall refute every tongue that rises against you in judgment. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord and their vindication from me, declares the Lord. May the Lord add His blessing to the reading of His Word. You may be seated. <clears throat> well, it is a, uh, a unique privilege of mine uh, to be able to uh, preach a Christmas message uh, to you. Um, it's unfortunate the circumstances uh, surrounding it, uh, but I am very happy to, um, to take this slot and to be able to uh, speak about uh, the incarnation of our Savior. Um, we as a, uh, as a culture, as a community, mankind in general, uh, for a very long time, forever indeed, has been obsessed with uh, the narrative storyline of the Chosen One, uh, long foretold, uh, coming and delivering his his people, right? Uh, you just think to some very popular movies, and this is the uh, this is the narrative, this is the storyline, right? You have, uh, of course, you have Anakin Skywalker, uh, the 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 one who'd bring the the prophesied one who'd bring balance to the Force. You have uh, Neo, who was prophesied long ago. He's the chosen one to destroy the Matrix. And uh, my personal favorite, you have Aragorn, the promised king who was going to unite uh, the kingdom of man, the two kingdoms of men uh, together uh, to destroy the ring. <clears throat> and of course, all these 
amazing, fantastic stories uh, are rooted and uh, are so incredible because they mirror the true story, which is that Jesus Christ is the chosen one, long foretold, of ancient promises who was going to come and free His people, destroy His enemies, and bring us into eternal life. And we celebrate this chosen one in this season, His arrival. Um, All of these stories, of course, are derived from this one. And the question that I want to to examine with you this morning and to uncover is, what was this chosen one prophesied to do and how does the Old Testament sketch that and then how does he fulfill it? <clears throat> and the Old Testament, of course, is full of questions and promises. Questions and promises concerning the chosen one. It would ask questions and then the answer, of course, would find its fulfillment in a manger in Bethlehem. And if we were to take the whole Old Testament and uh, try to boil it down to uh, a smaller portion, um, it'd be really, if we were talking about the promises concerning the Messiah, it would be really hard to argue someone away from using the book of Isaiah uh, to, to establish their study in what does the Old Testament tell us about who Jesus is going to be when he comes. And if you are to boil Isaiah down, it'd be really hard uh, to not include uh, chapters 53, 54, and 55 in this discussion of who was Jesus going to be, how does he fulfill the Old Testament, and what does that mean for us going forward. So let me just give you a little bit of context of the book of Isaiah to set us up as we enter into chapter 54. Um, in Isaiah, uh, we see uh, Israel, the, the two kingdoms split. Uh, we see uh, Judah is in the process of squandering uh, their position in the land and in the good graces of Yahweh. Of course, he brought them out of Egypt, set them in the land, said, obey me and you'll live, disobey me and I'll exile you from the land. And Judah was well on their way uh, to being exiled. Eventually, uh, typified by the failure of their king Hezekiah to not trust in man's kingdoms, but to trust in Yahweh, Uh, He put faith in the nation of Babylon. Israel is promised that they will be invaded by Assyria and exiled. Uh, So it was not by Assyria, by Babylon. In the next breath, so the promise of exile is given in, in chapter 39 of Isaiah. The next two words after the promise of exile is the word comfort. Comfort. Comfort your people. So the promise of judgment is leveled against Judah, and then the promise of comfort is also given to Judah. God was going to bring the nation of Babylon against them in judgment, but then He was also going to lead them out of captivity by His great mercy. Just like Yahweh led them out of Egypt, He's also going to lead them out of Babylon. And this redemption is spelled out for us in Isaiah 40, through 48. And with the rest of Isaiah's prophecy, Isaiah digs into Israel's deeper issue. So God is going to send them into Babylon. He's going to exile them. And then he's going to bring them out of Babylon. And that was going to fix all their problems and they were going to be absolutely perfect after that. Unfortunately, that's not what we see happening. Because Israel's problem was not a positional problem. Their problem was a deep, inward heart problem. It didn't matter that they were in Babylon. It didn't matter that they were in Israel. Their exile, their slavery, was a slavery of the heart. So simply bringing them out of exile of Babylon was not going to fix them. God was going to need to appoint a new Savior, a better Savior, who could bring a deeper deliverance. And that's what Isaiah begins to prophesy in chapters 48 through uh, 55. <clears throat> but here, look, look, look at what Isaiah says about Israel in Isaiah 42, 18 through 20. 
Hear, you deaf, and look, you blind, that you may see. Who is blind but my servant? And deaf is my messenger whom I send. Who is blind is my dedicated one, or blind as the servant of the Lord. This is Israel, and he's saying that they're blind, they're deaf, they don't understand. He sees many things, but does not observe them. His ears are open, but he does not hear. And even speaking of the exile, he says in 42.25, So he poured on him the heat of his anger and the might of battle. It set him on fire all around, but Israel did not understand. It burned him up, but he did not take it to heart. So an outward change of circumstances was not going to fix the nation of Israel. They needed a deeper deliverance. And this is what the chosen one would bring. He would bring a deeper deliverance. And like Israel, our problem is not a problem of circumstance. We tend to think it is, right? Like, well, if this had happened in my life, or if this person would be like this, or if I was in this job, or if this was happening, or if we had this house, or whatever, then things would be better. It's not true. Your issues, my issues, are not outward. They are inward problems. Deep issues of the heart that need a miraculous Savior. And praise be to God, He raises up a miraculous Savior, a deliverer to free Israel from their spiritual chains. And when you think about what the Savior is going to be like, you picture Him in your mind, He's not exactly what you're thinking. Isaiah 53 describes the Savior to us. <clears throat> Without getting into the whole chapter, because we could spend many sermons in that chapter, of course. Surely, He has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed Him stricken and smitten by God and afflicted. But He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon Him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with His wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, have turned every one to His own way. The Lord has laid on Him the iniquity of us all. So in Isaiah, you have God, Yahweh, raising up a king named Cyrus to deliver his people physically from Babylon. All the glory of the, the kingdom of Persia uh, wrapped up in King Cyrus, and he was incredible. And he sends the people back to Israel, and their problem carries their, their problem goes with them back to Israel. So God says, I'm going to raise up a savior, a deliverer, who is going to be able to accomplish what Cyrus was not able to accomplish. And he raises up Jesus, born of a virgin in the manger of the city of David. No room in the inn for him. You would not look twice at him if you saw him. And he is the one who is going to be able to accomplish the deeper spiritual deliverance that we all so desperately need. And this is the season that we're celebrating right now. It's incredible. This is the time when Christ came to accomplish this deeper deliverance. Christ came to pour out His soul to death and be numbered with the transgressors. Isaiah 53 says at the end of the chapter, He bore the sin of many and makes intercession for them. He accomplished the deeper deliverance that Israel and us and the rest of the world so desperately needs. And the question is, is how are we to respond to the Savior? Well, Isaiah 54 so helpfully tells us how we're supposed to respond to the Savior, to the revelation of Christ. It's mankind's response to the promised chosen one, long foretold with ancient promises, finally arriving. And what Isaiah 54 so masterfully does, which we're not going to have time to really dig into everything, of course, is... In some ways, Isaiah 54 sums up the entire Old Testament by making reference to each of the major covenants of God. 
the Abrahamic covenant, the Mosaic covenant, and the Davidic covenant, even the Noahic covenant, which isn't a major covenant, it mentions, and shows how all of these covenants, separate covenants, flow together into one stream and are executed upon the person of Christ. <clears throat> and this execution, this uh, fulfillment, has major practical relevance for us today. And that's my job this morning, is to show you how these ancient promises have major practical relevance for us today. So the question I want to ask this morning is what does the coming of Christ mean for us? What does the coming of Christ mean for us? The first thing that it means is that the barren one should sing. The barren one should sing. See what he says in chapter, uh, chapter 54, verse 1 through 3. Sing, O barren one who did not bear. Break forth into singing and cry aloud. You who have not been in labor, for the children of the desolate one will be more than the children of her who is married, says the Lord. Enlarge the place of your tent and let your curtains of your habitations be stretched out. Do not hold back. Lengthen your cords. Strengthen your stakes. For you will spread abroad to the right and the left. And your offspring will possess the nations and will people the desolate cities. It's hard to get more glorious than this, these first few verses um, uh, of, of the promises that lay within it for us, right? Um, as we know from studying Genesis, mankind was created uh, to be productive. Not just reproductive, but productive in all sorts of different ways. <clears throat> and the fall has distorted that reality. We were created to be productive and the fall has severely inhibited that commandment for us, right? Adam was meant to work the ground. The ground would work against him now. Eve was meant to bear children and there would be great pain in that. Um, instead of being productive and fruitful, mankind is now assailed by things like laziness, sickness, infertility, natural disasters, famine, Jealousy of other humans, we see that in Cain and Abel. Wild animals, if, if, if anybody's ever planted a garden, they know uh, that last one very well, how you do all this work and then some dumb rabbit comes and eats all your tomatoes, right? <clears throat> all of these things and more contribute to the problem of a lack of fruitfulness for mankind in this cursed world. We were created to have dominion, right? To plant gardens, to expand, to create things. And because of sin, all of this creative, uh, creative energy and dominion having power has been hampered. So what does this promise teach us? The coming of Christ would mark the beginning of an unparalleled return to human productivity. This is why the barren one is to sing. It's not simply talking about those who are not able to bear children. This is every one of us is a barren one, not able to be what we were created to be, exemplifying the image of God. Because Christ has come, He is returning us to our former glory, our productive God likeness. The imagery here makes a lot of sense. Stretch out, right? Why would you need to stretch out? Well, you're producing things, right? Strengthen the cords. Why do the, tent, why do the cords of the tent need to be strong? Well, the tent is going to get bigger, right? Um, uh, what was it? Strengthen the stakes? You know, you see the imagery here. Uh, we're going to be massively productive when the Messiah comes because He has come to return us to our formal, former glory, our God-likeness. And we see, of course, in the book of Genesis, this problem be talked about a lot, this unproductive issue, right? Um, in, in the book of Genesis, uh, humanity is described um, very frequently as uh, being afflicted by barrenness and unproductivity, 
right? There's many famines that happen in Genesis. There's raiders that, that steal things. There's women who cannot have children. Uh, there's a flood which destroys everything. We were created to be productive in a number of different ways, from bearing children to harvesting crops to keeping animals. Mankind has struggled with this mightily since the fall, and it's epitomized in the book of Genesis by the one God chooses to be the father of the line of Jesus. Of course, he chooses old Abraham and barren Sarah. And he promises them what? Productivity. Right? Promises them a son who was going to be the heir of all the produce that God was going to create for them. You see the double promise there? He says in Genesis 15.5, God brought Abraham outside and said, look toward heaven, number the stars if you're able to number them. And he said to him, so shall your offspring be. And we know from studying Genesis that God ultimately keeps His promise to Abraham. right? Gives him a son. Isaac is born from his own line, from his own body. Isaac is born by the miraculous power of God. And yet, Abraham dies and we are still left with a question. God gave him one star And how many stars did he promise him? All the stars in the sky. So this is a question, right? One that is going to need need to be revisited, right? And we go to maybe maybe his children will be the ones that have children like the stars. Well, what's wrong with his children? They too are smitten with barrenness. They too are fighting amongst each other. They too are not able to fulfill this promise. So God is going to have to do this in a different way. You see, Abraham passed on and his sons and daughters still struggled with barrenness. The curse of unproductivity was still heavy upon the land. So since that is the case, why should the barren one sing? The barren one should sing because Christ is going to change that. Christ is going to do what Abraham was not able to do. The barren should sing because Christ has come. Deity in the flesh, being born of a virgin to restore humanity to its former productive glory. This miraculous appearance, both in incarnation and in the virgin birth, are signs of what He came to do. See, we think about the coming of Christ and we marvel at the virgin birth, right? Which we should. It's, you know, it's a, it's a miracle. What we skip over is God taking on a body, which is more miraculous. It's in every single way, this occurrence, this incarnation was radically miraculous. And it was the forebearer of more radically miraculous, productive events happening in the future. He came to make humanity miraculously productive again. He came to make us into trees that bear fruit again. He came to make us fit to go into all the world preaching the Gospel, replicating the image of God into all the nations. So, we live in a different time than Abraham, right? Christ has come. He's, the barren one is singing. Christ has come. He has brought this deliverance. And yet, is our land, is our world, are our people still cursed, still smitten with this problem of barrenness? Yes, we are. We live in a different time than Abraham, But we also live in a different time than where we are going to live when Christ comes back. Barrenness has been stricken from the land. It's on the way out. But we still see the remnants of it. So how are we supposed to live in the midst of this already not yet 
dwelling. And my word to you is to embrace the productivity of Christ in every circumstance, knowing that things are not perfect here. Do all to the glory of God in every moment. Seek to spread the glory of God into every corner of your influence. Pray to see it replicated in your children. Don't just hope and pray and work to raise up healthy children, though you should do that. Work and pray and hope to raise up spiritually healthy children as well. Be productive in both areas. Seek to see it cover your neighborhoods. It should bother you that your neighbors are not coming to church. Work to see it spread throughout the sanctuary. You should be concerned about the people sitting next to you. And to the end of the earth until the whole world is full of the glory of God as the water covers the sea. And when Christ comes back, every vestige, every sliver, every little fleeting shadow of barrenness is going to be completely eradicated. So that's why we can sing. Secondly, in addition to the barren singing, we also see that it's time for the shameful one to lift up his head. It's time for the shameful one to lift up his head. Look at verse 4. Fear not, for you will not be ashamed. Be not confounded, for you will not be disgraced. For you will forget the shame of your youth and the reproach of your widowhood. You will remember no more. For your Maker is your husband, and the Lord of hosts is His name, and the Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer, the God of the whole earth He is called. For the Lord has called you like a wife deserted and grieved in spirit, like a wife of youth when she is cast off, says your God. For a brief moment I deserted you, but with great compassion I will gather you. In overflowing anger for a moment I hid my face from you, but with everlasting love I have compassion on you, says the Lord your Redeemer. This is like the days of Noah to me as I swore that the waters of Noah should go, no more go over the earth. I, so I have sworn that I will not be angry with you, and I will not rebuke you. For the mountains may depart and the hills be removed, but my steadfast love shall not depart from you, and my covenant of peace shall not be removed, says the Lord, who has compassion on you. <clears throat> so, in this uh, section of Scripture, I think you have uh, three different things happening. Okay, You have... Failure, moral failure, right? The shame of your youth, you went away from me, like a woman, like a a young wife stricken, right? Uh, You have judgment, right? For a moment I deserted you. And then you have what? Redemption. You have redemption, right? Um, For in overflowing anger, for a moment I hid my face from you, but with everlasting love I have compassion on you. What we have here is a story of mankind's moral failure, God's judgment, and then God's beautiful restoration. And in order for the beautiful restoration to be fully appreciated, you have to be willing and courageous to see the depths of mankind's moral bankruptcy. You will never see the glory of the gospel until you understand and appreciate the ugliness of sin. And the problem is is we don't like doing that, right? Especially nowadays. We don't like dredging the depths of mankind's moral emptiness. We think that if we were to dig deep enough and hard enough and really find ourselves that we would be able to, in our own power, discover the path by which we should live and the way in which we should treat each other. We think that inherently mankind is good and has been clouded by a number of different, um, um, a number of different influences, negative influences. Unfortunately, this idea is just not biblical. I shouldn't say unfortunately. Fortunately, this idea is just not biblical. You don't have it in you. You have nothing in you that is good. I have nothing in me that is good. There's, I, could, I could take as many guesses as I would like to about the right path that I should walk, 
the right way that I should treat you, and I will never come up with the right answer. Even if I come up with the right answer on the outside, my motivations for that answer will not be correct. So we are desperately, hopelessly corrupt and lost. But this sets the stage for how glorious and wonderful and perfect the Gospel is at taking desperate, hopeless, lost people and bringing them back into God's family. The darkness of man's sin is overcome by the brilliant light of God's love. You cannot water either of those things down. We are evil fully to our core. And the question that you have to wrestle with is, where have you failed morally? Where are you indicted here? Um, I think it is easy for us uh, to understand the bankruptness of mankind's moral uh, account since Pastor Ben has walked us through the Ten Commandments. Um, There was a... um, We were at lunch uh, with uh, my parents and Daniel Deanne after the sermon on lying, I believe it was. And um, we were all at lunch talking and, and slightly, somewhat jokingly, saying, well, you know, Pastor Ben said that that is a lie. You can't, you know, that, that's what you just said is technically a lie, you know. And, uh, and uh, Daniel said, um, he goes, yeah, I, uh, I just learned that I, no matter what I am do, I'm going to be lying. I'm going to be sinning. And I laughed. I said, well, I said, you could just not talk. And he laughed. And then I thought, actually, Pastor Ben said that silence is in some form a way of lying too. So I said, well, we're just, we're just hopelessly evil, right? We're just hopelessly, hopelessly sinful, corrupt. And, uh, and it's true. It's, it's so true. And it's, it's in some ways just like you're, you're looking at it like, I will never be able to dig myself out of this hole. And it's true. You won't be able to dig yourself out of this hole. And this story of fail, moral failure, judgment, and restoration is the story of the Mosaic Covenant, right? We, spoiler alert for what you know, Pastor Ben's sermon here is on Exodus. Uh, God's going to give them the whole law, and they're not going to be able to do it, right? Um, actually, I'm not really spoiling it that much because Moses tells them, you're not going to be able to do this, right? And uh, because they're not able to do it, God's going to judge them. And then God is going to restore them. In the law, God promised that if they keep the law, they will have abundant life in the land. But if they break the law, the covenant that they that they break the covenant, that they would be spit out of the land as the Canaanites were before them. And their moral failure is played out for us before us in Judges through Kings. So God gives them the land; they enter the land, and then from Judges onward. Through the book of Kings, we see just how morally bankrupt these people are. We are. Don't judge judge them. And God's promise of destruction comes true as we see in Isaiah. But God cannot leave them in His wrath for long. Notice what He says in Hosea 11.8. The prophet where God compares the relationship He has with Israel to a man who takes a wife and then the wife becomes a prostitute. Some severe imagery there. That's what God says in Hosea 11.8. How can I give you up, O Ephraim? How can I hand, hand you over, O Israel? How can I make you like Adma? How can I treat you like Zeboim? My heart recoils within me. My compassion grows warm and tender. After the promise of judgment in Isaiah 39, the next two words of the prophecy, chapter 40, verse 1, the next two words are comfort. Comfort. Yahweh is eager to pardon Judah and restore her because of His covenant love for her. So He says in the beginning of Isaiah, though their sin is white as scarlet, His love for them will make them white as white as scarlet. His lo- though they are red as scarlet, His love for them will make them white as snow. This yearning and love is the same for us for those who trust in Christ. So as you consider your moral bankruptcy, 
in, in all of its ugliness, to the depths of it, understand that that was not enough to keep God from growing warm and compassionate towards you. So don't, don't, go, don't go, go all the way with your moral bankruptcy. It doesn't matter. No matter how evil you are, God is still offering His warm and tender compassion and mercy towards you. Though we have a past that is as dark as the night, our future is gloriously bright because of God's unfailing love for us. And this is why the shamed person should lift their heads up when they hear that Christ has come, the chosen one. And yet, there's still a question that this covenant leaves us hanging with. When has the restoration happened? I still sin. Do you still sin? Am I the only one? I hope I'm not the only one. We still sin. We still are broken. We still are corrupt. Right? Even the best things we can do now are in some way tainted with sin. Once again, we have to remind ourselves that though we are living in a different time than Moses, we still are not living in the time where all things are going to be made perfect. We call this the in-between, the already not yet. And it can be tricky to navigate. Here's my applicational idea for you. The law of the kingdom is love. We've described this in my Galatians, uh, when we taught through Galatians. Uh, we've been teach, talking about this in my uh, Sermon on the Mount class. This is, what, this is, this is what's going to happen. Okay? It's on the way. The kingdom of this world of man, which is selfish and, and opposed to each other, is passing away. It's over. right? It's been, it's been conquered. The king who is coming and is on his way to, to here has said... In, before I get there, the law of the kingdom shall be in place. And when I get there, it will be fully in place and fully enforced. So what should we do as we await for this kingdom? We should listen to the kingdom, king who's coming, right? And, and, because you're, and don't think that because you're not going to be able to keep it perfectly, you shouldn't try to keep it at all. That's not how it works. God is forming you and fitting you for the kingdom that is coming by calling you to walk in obedience right now. Look at how uh, Hosea pleads with Israel um, after God promises restoration. Come, let us return to the Lord, for He has torn us that He might heal us. He has struck us down and He will bind us up. After two days, He will revive us. On the third day, He will raise us up that we may live before Him. Let us know, let us press on to know the Lord. His going out is as sure as the dawn. He will come to us as the showers, as the spring rains that water the earth. Press on to know and to live like the Lord. That is what we are called to do in the already not yet. So, the, pro- the ancient promises of the coming Messiah, what is the world going to re- how is the world going to react when He gets here? The first idea is that the barren one will sing. The second is that the ones who are ashamed will lift their head. The third is that the afflicted ones will be comforted. The afflicted ones will be comforted. Look at verse 11. O afflicted one, storm-tossed and not comforted, behold, I will set your stones in anemone and lay your foundations with sapphires. I will make your pinnacles of agate, your gates of carbuncles, and all your wall of precious stones. All your children shall be taught by the Lord, and great shall be the peace of your children. In righteousness you shall be established. You shall be far from oppression, for you shall not fear, and from terror, for it shall not come near you. If anyone stirs up strife, it is not from me. 
Whoever stirs up strife with you shall fall because of you. Behold, I have created the smith who blows the fire of coals and produces a weapon for its purpose. I have also created the ravager to destroy. No weapon that is fashioned against you shall succeed, and you shall refute every tongue that rises against you in judgment. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord and their vindication from me, declares the Lord. The third ancient promise, the third prophecy of the Chosen One is that all His people who are afflicted by enemies on every side will be comforted and will see their enemies fall before them. This deliverance from your enemies will bring unparalleled peace. See the the consistencies here? We have unparalleled peace productivity, unparalleled righteousness, and unparalleled peace. Let's unpack a few of these ideas. A lot of text here. First, Yahweh promises to build up His people on all these sorts of expensive gemstones. Uh, Of course, it's figurative language. Um, This seems... I shouldn't write. This seems to be hinting. This is hinting at a return to Eden, right? Where Eden... Uh, was full of these stones as well. You refer back to Genesis when it describes this. And it seems to be prescribed to happen at the end of Revelation with the building of the new Jerusalem. <clears throat> Look at what it says in Revelation 21 and compare this to what we're looking at in Isaiah 54. The wall was built of jasper, while the city was pure gold like clear gla- glass. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with every kind of jewel. The first was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth carnelian, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysoprase, the eleventh jacinth, and the twelfth amethyst. So you have this this prophecy uh, uh, here in Isaiah 54, well, in Eden, Isaiah 54, and then here of this uh, this beautiful city being built up, this uh, incredibly uh, wonderful city. And uh, the, the idea behind these expensive stones is um, that, you know, if, you, if you're a city that's constantly being attacked by your enemies, what are you not going to put on your walls? You're not going to put these expensive stones on your walls, right? You're not going to do that. Why? Well, you, first of all, you may not have time to do something like that. And second of all, they're just going to get stolen. I want you to imagine uh, you're, you know, you're living in, in the south and there's a hurricane that's coming in, and indeed is here and you're, you're, you're living through the storm and you look out your window and you see your neighbor trimming his hedges. What are you going to think? This guy's out of his mind, right? What, what is he doing this for? He's just going to have to redo it all in a second, right? Uh, this, this idea of building up in wealth is a thing that you do when you don't have any enemies. And that is what God is promising uh, to us. The second idea is that peace is being enjoyed directly caused because from the oldest to the youngest, people are taught the truth of the Lord. Long-standing promise in the Old Testament that in the kingdom of God, the world is going to be covered with the knowledge of God as the water covers the sea. And that this covering was going to create unparalleled peace. As God's glory covers, it also creates peace. Third, in righteousness, this people will be established. And this is different than how God established Israel in the land, right? He established Israel in the land, then He called them to what? Be righteous, and you will live. They were not able to do that, so God is going to establish the kingdom of God, in righteousness. He's going to make you righteous and then put you in the land. And what will happen? You'll be righteous. Fourth, since they are established by the Lord, they have no reason for fear. You shall be far from oppression, for you shall not fear, and from terror, for it shall not come near you. And fifth, This establishment will still be in the presence of enemies. This is is what's interesting. This is where you get the already not yet idea coming. If anyone stirs up strife, it's not from me. 
saying that there may be people who stir up strife. There may be problems. There may be attacks against you, right? But these attacks will not stand what God is promising. So I want you to imagine that you enter into a room and there's a bunch of different uh, scary monster cu- cardboard cutouts in the room that they look terrifying. Are they? Do they look scary? Yes. Can they hurt you? No. Right. Um, it's it's somewhat like a uh, um, like a uh, like a haunted house sort of thing, right? Where you go to these things and. They, they, these people are paid to scare people who come into these things. I mean, who signs up for that sort of a job? I don't know. Although it is kind of fun to scare people, so maybe that is that is the uh, maybe that's the draw. But uh, but you know, at some point, you know that this is just a uh, a facade that these people are not actually able or, or going to hurt you. And that is what you live in right now, with things like sickness. And things like death, things like poverty, sin. These enemies are still here, still attack you every day. You know that. I know that. But even the worst of them, which is death, has no power over you. That is the type of victory that Christ is saving us to. That is what he's bringing us to. That is the city we are living in right now. Of course, this radical peace and victory over enemies for the kingdom of God is deeply reminiscent of the Davidic reign and kingdom. Right? Uh, David rises to power after Saul and conquers Israel's enemies, brings them into times of unparalleled peace. He says this in 2 Samuel 7, After the king David had settled into his palace, the Lord had given him rest, from all his enemies around him. If you read 1 Samuel, you will notice that Israel seems to be constantly at war with somebody. Because they were constantly at war with somebody. Saul was constantly fighting. David was constantly fighting. So this verse here is incredible. That they had peace and rest from their enemies on all sides because of what God had done for them. God had given David the ability to wage war and have conquest against all of his enemies and gave his kingdom unparalleled peace. Peace to the effect that when they decided to, they went out from their land to wage war to expand the kingdom. This is not a defensive maneuver, but an offensive maneuver. And then after his son, Sol- or so after David, his son Solomon is raised up and he becomes another beacon for peace. And instead of conquering nations, nations are coming to him to learn about the things of God. Unfortunately, this peace did not last. Didn't even last past Solomon. After he departs the throne, enemies rise again because the kings after David and Solomon were not so faithful. Enemies rise again, even enemies as close as the kingdom dividing and warring against each other, Israel and Judah. It was a short-lived peace. It was a question of, I thought this peace was going to last longer. So why should the afflicted be comforted when their enemies seem to be able to rally so quickly? They should be comforted because Christ, He is the ultimate conqueror king And he has come to crush his enemies under his feet. He is here to do what David was not able to do. And this is what we see happening when Christ comes on the scene. Read through the Gospels. The enemies, the Pharisees, the demons, sin, death, sickness, poverty, they all stand no chance against the ministry of Christ. Christ's reign began when he was born in this earth, and as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be, put, to be destroyed is death. Like David, Christ will bring unparalleled peace to his kingdom. David did that as well. But unlike David, Christ is going to bring unparalleled peace to his kingdom that will last forever 
and the gates of hell will not prevail against this kingdom. Once again, we live in this in-between, right? The enemies have been conquered, and yet, you might die. You might get sick. You might uh, experience significant loss. How are we victorious in this loss? Seems like these enemies are still winning over us. Once again, we're living in this already, not yet. Christ's enemies are being systematically conquered around us, and when He returns, He will wage final and total war against them all, conquering them finally. That's how it ends in Revelation 20. And the devil who was, had, been dece- had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet were. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. So, just like when you think about Christ, and He's not who you think He is going to be, His reign is also not the kind of reign that you would think that it is. We conquer, not with the sword, but by the blood of those who pour out their life, not loving their lives unto death, but living for the kingdom in spite of what it might cost you today. That's how the church conquers. That's how the church's enemies are put under its feet. Should we be surprised at that? Is that not how Christ conquered? Didn't come to wage war. Told His disciples to put their swords away and died. What are we supposed to do now? We are to live in the victory of Christ and wait for our surroundings to match that reality. Live in the victory of Christ and wait for the day that our surroundings match that reality. Are you facing enemies right now? Yeah. Of course you are. We all are. You have to know that no matter how ugly it gets, those enemies will not prevail against you. Death might overtake you. But what happens the moment someone dies in Christ? They're alive. These enemies cannot stand before the power of the kingdom that is being built right now. And we're called to participate in the building and not to fear no matter what comes before us because no matter what comes before us cannot stand. They're cardboard cutouts of scary monsters. They're not, they don't have any power over us anymore. As we conclude, I'm going to have the musicians come up. The prophecies of the Chosen One are as glorious as they are true. The barren will be productive, the shame will be lifted up, and the afflicted will be comforted. You must see yourself in all those categories. As barren, as shamed, and as afflicted so that you can receive the productivity, the lifting up, and the comfort. All that is left for you now, now that that the Chosen One has come, the Kingdom has been set, and it is growing, and it is going to be here fully at any moment it can be here, all that is left now is to follow the advice of Isaiah 55, verse 1. Come. Everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. He who has no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me, and eat what is good, 
and delight yourselves in rich fruit, food. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear that your soul may live, and I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, my sure love for David. And Christ is that fulfillment of, the, of David, and his eternal kingdom has been established, and God's love for you is available by means of faith in the Son of God who's come and whose birth we celebrate in this time.